Hey guys, Lord Nairn White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God. Back with you with the next video in our series, Great Expectations. Without further ado, returning to Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Well, I rather thought I would give up that point too. After another silent turn in the garden, I fell back on the main position. Biddy, said I, I made a remark respecting my coming down here often to see Joe, which you received with a marked silence. Have the goodness, Biddy, to tell me why. Are you quite sure, then, that you will come to see him often? asked Biddy, stopping in the narrow garden walk and looking at me under the stars with a clear and honest eye. Oh, dear me, said I as if I found myself compelled to give up Biddy in despair. This really is a very bad side of human nature. Don't say any more, if you please, Biddy. This shocks me very much. For which cogent reason I kept Biddy at a distance during supper, and when I went up to my own old little room, took as stately a leave of her as I could. In my murmuring soul, deem reconciliable, reconcilable with the churchyard and the event of that day, of the day. As often as I was restless in the night, and that was every quarter of an hour, I reflected what an unkindness, what an injury, what an injustice Biddy had done me. Early in the morning I was to go. Early in the morning I was out and looking in unseen at one of the wooden windows of the forge. There I stood, for minutes, looking at Joe already at work with the glow of health and strength upon his face that made it show as if the bright sun of life in store for him was shining on it. Goodbye, dear Joe. No, don't wipe it off. For God's sakes, give me your blackened hand. I shall be down soon and often. Never too soon, sir, said Joe, and never too often, Pip. Biddy was waiting for me at the kitchen door, with a mug of new milk and a crust of bread. Biddy, said I, when I gave her a hand at parting. I am not angry, but I am hurt. No, don't be hurt, she pleaded quite pathetically. Let, let only me be hurt, I have, if I have been ungenerous. Once more the mists were rising as I walked away. If they disclosed to me, as I suspect they did, that I should not come back, and that Biddy was quite right. All I can say is, they were quite right too. Chapter 36 Herbert and I went on from bad to worse in the way of increasing our debts, looking into our affairs, leaving margins, and the like exemplary transactions, and time went on. Whether or no, as he has a way of doing, and I came of age in fulfillment of Herbert's prediction, that I should do so before I knew where I was. Herbert himself had come of age eight months ago before me, as he had done nothing else than his majority to come into. The event did not make a profound sensation in Barnard's Inn, but we had looked forward to my one-and-twentieth birthday with a crowd of speculations and anticipations, for we had both considered that my guardian could hardly help saying something definite on that occasion. I had taken care to have it well understood in Little Britain when my birthday was, on the day before it, I received an official note from Wemmick, informing me that Mr. Jaggers would be glad if I would call upon him at five in the afternoon of the auspicious day. This convinced us that something great was to happen, and threw me into an unusual flutter when I repaired to my guardian's office a model of punctuality. In the outer office, Wemmick offered me his congratulations and incidentally rubbed the side of his nose with a folded piece of tissue paper that I liked the look of. But he said nothing respecting it, 
and motioned me with a nod into my guardian's room. It was November, and my guardian was standing before his fire leaning his back against the chimney piece with his hands under his coattails. Well, Pip, said he, I must call you Mr. Pip today. Congratulations, Mr. Pip. We shook hands. He was always a remarkably short shaker, and I thanked him. Take a chair, Mr. Pip, said my guardian, as I sat down, and he preserved his attitude and bent his brows at his boots. I felt a disadvantage, which reminded me of that old time when I had been put upon a tombstone, that two ghastly casts were on the shelf that two ghastly casts on the shelf were not far from him, and their expression was as if they were making a stupid apoplectic attempt to attend to the conversation. Now, my young friend, my guardian began, as if I were a witness in the box, I am going to have a word or two with you. If you please, sir. What do you suppose? said Mr. Jaggers bending forward to look at the ground, and then throwing his head back to look at the ceiling. What do you suppose you are living at the rate of? At the rate of, sir? At, repeated Mr. Jaggers, still looking at the ceiling. The rate of, and then looked all round the room, and paused with his pocket handkerchief in his hand, halfway to his nose. I had looked into my affairs so often that I had thoroughly destroyed any slight notion I might ever have had of their bearings. Reluctantly, I confessed myself quite unable to answer the question. This reply seemed agreeable to Mr. Jaggers, who said, I thought so, and blew his nose with an air of satisfaction. Now I have asked you a question, my friend, said Mr. Jaggers. Have you anything to ask me? Of course, it would be a great relief to me to ask you several questions. Sir, but I remember your prohibition. Ask one, said Mr. Jairus. Is my benefactor to be made known to me today? No. Ask another. Is that confidence to be imparted to me soon? Wave that a moment said Mr. Jaggers, and ask another. I looked about me, but there appeared to be now no possible escape from the inquiry. Have I anything to receive, sir? On that, Mr. Jaggers said triumphantly, I thought we should come to it, and called to Wemmick to give him that piece of paper. Wemmick appeared, handed it in, and disappeared. Now, Mr. Pip, said Mr. Jaggers. Attend, if you please. You have been drawing pretty freely here. Your name occurs pretty often in Wemmick's cash book. But you are in debt, of course. I am afraid I must say yes, sir. You must say yes, don't you? Sorry, you know you must say yes, don't you? Said Mr. Jaggers. Yes, sir. I don't ask what you owe, because you don't know. And if you did know, you wouldn't tell me. You would say less. Yes, yes, my friend, cried Mr. Jaggers, waving his forefinger to stop me. As I made a show of protesting, it's likely enough that you think you wouldn't, but you would. You'll excuse me, but I know better than you. Now take this piece of paper in your hand. You have got it. Very good. Now unfold it and tell me what it is. This is a bank note, said I. For five hundred pounds. That is a bank note, repeated Mr. Jaggers. For five hundred pounds. And a very handsome sum of money too, I should think. You consider it so? How could I do otherwise? Ah, but answer the question said Mr. Jaggers. Undoubtedly. You consider it, undoubtedly, a handsome sum of money. 
Now that handsome sum of money, Pip, is your own. It is a present to you on this day, in earnest of your expectations, and at the rate of that handsome sum of money per annum, and at no rate, at no higher rate, you are to live until the donor of the whole appears. That is to say, you will now take your money affairs entirely into your own hands, and you will draw from Wemmick one hundred and twenty-five pounds per quarter, until you are in communication with the fountain head, and no longer the mere agent. As I have told you before, I am the mere agent. I execute my instructions, and I am paid for doing so. I think them injudicious, but I am not paid for giving any opinion to their merits. I was beginning to express my gratitude to my benefactor for the great liberality with which I was treated, when Mr. Jagger stopped me. I am not paid, Pip, said he, coolly, to carry your words to any one, and then gathered up his coattails, as he had gathered up the subject, and stood frowning at his boots, as if he suspected them of designs against him. After a pause, I hinted. There was a question just now, Mr. Jaggers, which you desired me to waive for a moment. I hope I am doing nothing wrong in asking it again. What is it? said he. I might have known that he would never help me out, but it took me aback to have to shave the question afresh, as if it were quite new. Is it likely? I said, after hesitating that my patron, the fountain head you have spoken of, Mr. Jaggers, will soon... There I delicately stopped. Will soon what? asked Mr. Jaggers. That's no question as it stands, you know. We'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching. And I hope you enjoyed. Please, like comment, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care, and thanks again.